Hare Krishna, Adi Karaman Pro. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. Great to see you again. Thank you, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. It's always a pleasure being here with you and, and uh, our conversations are always very inspiring for me. Yes, bro. It's uh, been illuminating for me as well as for my readers. And I thought we would continue a thread of thought that we had developed in our previous session. So I'll be making notes, but I'm keeping the notes small over here. And when, we, when required, I'll zoom them out. But the topic I was thinking of the scope of Shabda. The last time, one of the points which you made very important was that Pratyaksha, uh, and Shabda, like every, every method of acquiring knowledge has its limitations. And one of them is that Shabda itself, the difficulty is to determine what exactly is Shabda. Mm-hmm. So, is every single word of scripture Shabda or is it that every single word of the Acharya is a Shabda? So, that is, that is itself a challenge. But if we consider today, what I want is if this is say everything that is knowable, hmm. Bhagavad Gita uses the word jnana, jnana, gnana, and jnana gamya. So, gnana is that which is knowable. So, is it that everything that is knowable is known solely through Shabda? Is that Shabda is something like this? That all knowledge that is there to be known can be known through Shabda? Or is it something like a part of reality is known, known through Shabda mm-hmm. and another part of reality is known through other ways? Or is it like, say, we could have various scenarios, Pratyaksha and Anuman, or is it that all of these are to be used for everything? So is it like we have the we have the Gaya? Hmm. And then is it that there are overlapping areas where you say something is known to sh- Pratyaksha, large part is known to Shabda, and something is known through Anuman. Hmm. So it's just a rough illustration of the question. And this question especially comes up, I would say, specifically with respect to science and scientific findings. Hmm? Especially yeah. when scientific findings seemed, or even normal observations, seem to be different from, seem telling us something different from what scripture is telling us. It could be with respect to cosmology, it could be with respect to chronology, it could be with respect to geography. So now we don't want to go into the specifics because that is a different subject in itself. But what we want to discuss is that to what extent is is Shabda valid? And where does the domain of Shabda end? Or does it end anywhere? So, so you can decide how you'd like to go ahead with this. Yeah. So so um, if I can just add a little bit of a nuance or explanation to your earlier statement that you quoted from our last uh, podcast, which is that... Um, it's not it's not so much uh, maybe I didn't express it properly in the last one. It's not so much that each pramana has a limitation, but our capacity to access that pramana is limited in some way. Each of the pramanas in in their um, you can say in their ideal uh, uh, form are actually perfect. Uh, they're they're wonderful. So just like for example, Jiva Goswami speaks of, the perfection of pratyaksha, which is empirical perception, is uh, vaidusha pratyaksha, the pratyaksha, the perception of those who are uh, um, wise, who can see the truth, right? Tattva darshi. So in that sense, pratyaksha is also perfect. But our capacity to, um, Very good point. to, to access pratyaksha accurately, our, our, even our capacity to access Shabda is limited, and so therefore, we uh, the one of the problems with pratyaksha is that our senses are imperfect, so our perception becomes imperfect. One of the problems with um, with uh, the um, shabda is that uh, we get fooled into thinking something is shabda when it's not. Just like when an and uh, a, a some some guru claims to be more than what he actually is and tries to mislead us uh, and claims much greater authority than he has, then 
many people follow him. So considering him to be Shabda, right? He's offering Shabda Pramana. Uh, or someone claims to be an avatar and speaks, then they think, oh, this is coming from the Lord. Therefore, it is revelation. Therefore, it's Shabda. So in that way, our ability to access Shabda uh, is imperfect. We we can um, we might not gain it properly. Okay. Yeah. yeah so I, I I think that's an important nuance to make. So we could say that Shabda is is in one sense being the revelation from the divine. It's it's perfect, but how its perfection can be accessed by us, or to what extent it can be accessed by us. So it's a you know in the eleventh can in the tenth canto, I think Parikshit Maharaj asked this question to Shukdev Goswami that given that our senses are imperfect, how can we understand the ultimate reality? How can we understand the perfect absolute truth through our senses? And then ultimately, I think that the, the answer is a little complicated overall. But essentially, it seems that he says that it boils down to mercy. That we do use our intelligence. It's not that. God has given us senses and intelligence just so that we reject them. It, but it's also not that just because we are trying to know God, that means suddenly those senses and intelligence are going to be, be perfect. Hmm. That it's by His grace. Am I paraphrasing appropriately? I mean, it's a big subject. Yes, yes. So so this is exactly what I want to discuss, Prabhu. Um, just, just for the sake of, of getting the ground laid out before we dive into your original question, um, let's just say that there are many ways of knowing something. And the Vedanta Acharyas give a different numbers, but uh, they boil them down into three main types. Shabda, Pratyaksha, and Anuman. Or we can say uh, Pratyaksha, Anuman, and Shabda. Yeah. Uh, pratyaksha being empirical sense perception, Anumana being, um, uh, being uh, uh, inference or okay. reasoning, logic. And uh, and Shabda being, uh, broadly speaking, verbal testimony, uh, verbal. Uh, um, so so when when we get some knowledge from a reliable source, that's broadly speaking Shabda. And Prabhupada gives the example that uh, how do you know who your father is? Well, the reliable source is your mother. So on a broad level, Shabda is just knowledge from a reliable source, but in a narrow uh, level. A shabda specifically refers to the revelation of the Vedas. Uh, the highest form of shabda, you can say, is uh, Vedic uh, knowledge. Uh, that is knowledge that is aporusheya. It's revealed not by a human being, but by the Lord himself. Mm. So, um, first of all... Uh, it's interesting. We could say that when you generalize it like this, this is the way we get to know everything yes it's it's a is there a pandemic you know we can see people who are sick we can infer that oh there's, there's so many people sick probably this is there all over the world and then we we hear from some reliable sources exactly now, of course there can always be a question of how reliable the sources are but in principle so this applies this three three even the idea of shabda the principle of Shabda can apply to our day-to-day -day operation also. Hmm. Hmm. De de definitely. Uh, not only, it, it must apply. And, and this is the point. These are different ways of accessing truth, right? Accessing knowledge. And in an ideal world, they should give us exactly the same results. Uh, if, we, if we think of them, if we think of it from the mind of God, right? If we think of it from Krishna's perspective, Krishna's Pratyaksha and Krishna's Anuman and Krishna's Shabda have no difference from each other. They're all, they give exactly the same knowledge because reality is the same, right? It's Sat. Uh, uh, Upanishad says Sadeva. There's only Sat. So reality is one. Therefore, all three should be ideally saying the, exactly the same thing or revealing the same truth, uh, maybe from different perspectives. Uh, but it's still... Approaching the same thing. So what I depicted is something what you're trying to say here. Yes, exactly. The, point the same direction. Yeah. Okay. But, but the problem is because of our limited capacity that we mentioned earlier, then what happens is that uh, they 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 end up pointing in different directions, right? So 
Shabda points one way, Pratyaksha points another way, and then we get all kinds of problems like what if science conflicts Shastra? Uh, what if my my own logic, if Shastra doesn't seem logical to me? Uh, what if my senses give something and logic gives something else, right? So all three of them can conflict with each other, primarily because we have no, uh, be, because our access to them is limited. So now generally the way the discourse I grew up with is that Pratyaksha and Anumar are unreliable. That is why we need Shabda. Right. So when we talk about the four defects and Jiva Goswami also talks about that in the Tato Sandarvas, in the initial part. Now, he doesn't uh, elaborate about the four defects. He just mentions them and it's assumed that the audience accepts it. Now, now we may go into much more about four defects and try to establish them. But I find uh, uh, that approach. So, so what you are saying is uh, that's one approach, but that's not the only approach. It's not because Pratyakshan and one are defective that we need Shabda. Is that our just as our limitations can lead us to being misled through protection and Anuman, our limitations can also lead us to being misled about what Shabda is and what Shabda is teaching. Hmm. Yes, Prabhu. And, and I think that's also Jiva Goswami's understanding uh, of the situation. Um, the the we 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 naturally emphasize the authority of Shabda. Uh, and the reason for that is because um at least an intelligent person doesn't need to be convinced about the authority of Anuman and Pratyaksha. We we get it in school, we see it with our own eyes, right? Children, even a child, when they see it, then they believe it. And you have to remind them, oh, don't believe it just because you see it. It may Something else may be deceiving you. You have to, just like when they've done studies that when children see something on TV, they tend to accept it as truth. Mm. Uh, when we know that so much on TV is not truth or it's the partial truth. So they have to be taught that. So because we tend to trust our senses naturally, and as we grow older, we tend to, to trust our brains, our minds, our logical capacities. Therefore, uh, the scriptures, the Acharyas emphasize the importance of Shabda. And because that's one reason. Another reason is because Shabda gives us access to information that is beyond um, uh, Pratyaksha and Anuman, that Pratyaksha and Anuman don't have access to. And so for that reason, they emphasize, and, and because the goal of spiritual life, the goal of the Acharyas is to help us uh, understand and experience that which is transcendental. Therefore, naturally, they're going to have to rely on Shabda more than Pratyaksha and Anuman. So this is why Shabda is emphasized. It's uh, It's highly emphasized. But I think it's a mistake on our part if we take that emphasis and use it to destroy or devalue completely the others. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so sh- sh- shab- shabda is important because it's 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 uh, um, it, it gives us knowledge about that which we cannot perceive uh, about the transcendental, and that's why it's emphasized. It's also something that we don't. Uh, 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 accept automatically, right? We have to, we have to learn how to accept authority to decide who is a reliable authority. It has to be taught. Whereas the senses, everyone accepts. No one needs to be taught mm. that. No, 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 it's interesting the way shraddha and this one is slightly different subject, but quickly, shraddha, the is often translated faith, but then Prabhupada at several places, translates Shraddha almost like inquisitiveness. In the first can, the second chapter, Prabhupada translates it as like the seriously inquisitive sage. Yeah. And even in the nine stages of Bhakti, where Shraddha comes in, Prabhupada, it's like positive curiosity. And later Nishtha is like a deep conviction or something like that. Nice point. So it's a, So this is also in one sense that we need some convincing, some persuasion that there is at least something beyond this world to inquire about. Right. So, and there is some way to know about it. Yes. So, so in that sense, uh, it's uh, that which we naturally accept. 
some we, we don't have to reject it but we have to recognize that it's it's limited and there's something more and that we have to train ourselves to accept yes so we could say almost it's like a pendulum effect our natural tendency is to accept protection anuman hmm. but sometimes as a reaction we might go and we might accept it's here it's only protection and we could go to only shabda hmm. so we might go from here to here initially but overall it's in one sense we could say all three are involved yes hmm. and and i'll give you one example pro of this um i was reading reading recently chapter 11 of gita and um arjun asks krishna i i i accept what you've told me but i want to see it now with my own eyes right chapter 10 krishna tells gives arjun a vibhuti yoga all his um how he can be seen in all of creation and all of creation can be seen in him and the and and arjun says now i want to see it with my own eyes and propad writes in the purport he says arjun already had strong faith in krishna but arjun understands that the readers may want to uh, some evidence of this they might might want to see it see this proof that krishna is krishna actually who he claims to be and this attitude uh, from the reader propad is not against it in fact he writes in one purport in chapter 11 he says uh, early on he says there are so many so called um avatars and gurus uh, who claim to be god when they claim to be god the we should immediately ask them then please show me your universal form your vishwarupa right so what is happening here there is ostensibly a, a potential source of shabda someone comes before us uh, and says i am krishna or i am an avatar or i am krishna's representative and uh, i i'm i'm god not representative i'm god i'm i'm the avatar and so therefore uh, immediately if if god is saying something is avatar is saying something then it has to be shabda right that's the the standard what krishna says that is shabda now but the problem is that often that claim is is uh, is uh, suspect or or not correct and so prabhupada is saying how do we verify it we ask them to show us uh, the universal form that's basically is asking us to utilize pratyaksha and anuman our own intelligence but combined with our perception to demonstrate the validity of supposed shabda and even that applies to krishna himself because prabhupada says even for krishna why should we accept on faith arjun says no 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 you have to show me and prabhupada doesn't reject that as being demoniac in nature he says this is okay people arjun already knows who krishna is he spent so much time with him but others may not so therefore he shows but the average claim to shabda is incorrect because most people cannot show this vishwarupa so we see how pratyaksha can directly help us corroborate shabda and why we cannot give up pratyaksha uh, at the uh, we we cannot accept shabda at the expense of pratyaksha or anumana because if we get rid of pratyaksha and anuman then we will end up in a situation of being extremely gullible it's beautifully put you know now that you're mentioning this the acharya has explained that in the ninth chapter krishna has used the word pashyame yogam ishwaram hmm and arjuna actually in the 11th chapter he says show me your rupa aishwaram <laughs> and so that that your connection with the world the opulent way so here yoga is used not in the sense of uh, of uh, the connection with the lord it's more of the lord connecting with the world and manifesting in the world so please show it to me so yoga aishwarya is more like a claim of shabda that krishna has made in the 6th uh, chapter 9th chapter Mm. Arjuna is saying you know rupa is associated with protection so it's exactly what you're saying yes and 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 pro if we go through it every pramana without the others ends up becoming a potential danger a potential trap for us right so if you accept shabda and turn off your your pratyaksha and anuman skills then you're going to end up uh, being fooled by any so called claim to revelation if you take uh if you take uh pratyaksha and you turn off anumana and shabda then your senses will mis- mislead you and jiva goswami gives many examples prabhupad gives many examples of this how 
your senses can easily deceive you. Um, there's so many optical illusions. And he Prabhupada's classic example of this is the sun, right? You look at the sun in the sky, it's the size of, you know, one inch, maybe like this. But by Anuman, you can understand that it's actually much, much bigger. It's bigger than all of the planets. So a sh Pratyaksha without Anuman uh, or, or without Shabda is very limited. Uh, so I, the example of China, right? I, I know that uh, that China exists. But if I used only Pratyaksha as the basis, then uh, I, I there's no veracity for it, right? Uh, I, without Shabda, I've never been to China myself. I cannot accept it, that it exists. In fact, we see the dangers of Pratyaksha alone in the, in the work of the British empiricist philosophers, particularly David Hume, who was a skeptic. And he came to the conclusion that he could not even accept the reality of cause and effect in this world. That there was, he did not know whether anything was predictable, whether any cause leads to an effect or not. Because Pratyaksha cannot get you there. You have to use Anuman uh, for that purpose, right? So he was, a, he was an extreme skeptic. In fact, David Hume famously said, that although the sun has risen for a million years before this, exactly on schedule, and although it, it rose yesterday also, there is no guarantee that it will rise tomorrow. Just because it's happened a million times doesn't mean that million plus one, n plus one is going to be the same thing. Mm -hmm. The only way you can conclude that n plus one is going to follow the same pattern is by Anuman, right? And by Shabda by putting these two things together. And because he refused to accept that, he only relied on Pratyaksha. He turned into an extreme skeptic, which is paralyzing, essentially, to live in this world, right? So what I mean to say is you can turn it both directions. You take Shabda and you remove Pratyaksha and you become a blind fool. You become, a, you have blind faith. That's and you take, yeah. yeah, and you take Pratyaksha and you remove Shabda and you, you become a skeptic. Uh, which is uh, paralyzed essentially as a skeptic. Mm -hmm. So, just you know, I read about David Hume, but the, the way you put it in this context is amazing. So, what he says is you can see a cause and you can see an effect. Uh, but all that you are saying is event A followed by event B. Correct. There's no way for you to know that event A caused event B. Exactly. And we could say, no, this is what we observed in the past. But you say, okay, but there's no guarantee. That means uh, it has to happen in the future. Exactly. I think that what uses the inductive method or induction. So the inductive method in science is in basically like Anuman. It's inference, it's reasoning. So now going back to Shabda alone, I was thinking that the point of uh, verifying Shabda, the Srila Prabhupada offer would quote this Falena Parichayate that we know who is a great devotee by seeing what results they have produced. So this is also, how do you know the fuller? It is at one level, Pratyaksha. And Prabhupada would say that, you know, that I'm carrying forward my spiritual master's mission. And I have the potency because, you know, so many books have been distributed, so many temples have been built, so many people have been attracted. Now, of course, that is not the sole thing. Because there might be so many people who, like Prabhupada said, they might be given somebody selling an imitation diamond. Mm -hmm. They will get far more customers than somebody who is selling a real diamond. Mm -hmm. So here we see that there is both the, this fallen, it's, it's accepted and it's also in one sense uh, not rejected but, but qualified, qualified or limited. Qualified. Yes, yes. So, so we could almost say that Shabda informs us about, it's like Shabda guides our protection. Okay, what fall to look for? What fruit to look for? And then follow also, when we see that fruit, then it increases our conviction in protection. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? So you could say. Yes. So in that sense, the two can go synergistically. Mm -hmm. Now, if you see practically, when new people come to, when new people start practicing bhakti, if they go for a pilgrimage or they go to Vrindavan, they go to Mayapur, or here in America, they go to Sadhu Sangha and they see hundreds of people practicing from various backgrounds. That protection at one level increases their faith. Hmm. 
hey, so many people are practicing it. There's, there's so much substance to this. There's so much, uh, if they go to ancient holy places in India, there's so much antiquity behind it, history behind it. And it's so so it, this is also an example of Pratyaksha, isn't it? Yes. Mm. And and a, a very much so, Prabhu. And, and Jiva Goswami uh, provides in his Sarva Samvadini, uh, his commentary on the Shat Sandarbhas, he, he provides several instances where Pratyaksha has a significant role to play in our understanding of Shabda. And he, he, he illuminates the relationship between Pratyaksha and, and Shabda in very nuanced and very uh, wonderful ways. It's not um, simplistic, his approach. He recognizes what, what we're discussing, what we're describing. Can you I, I've identified like several areas in which these two, the, the scope of Shabda is very much intertwined with the scope of Pratyaksha. That they're not, they can't be considered entirely separate. And Shabda cannot be considered to be, it, it doesn't suffocate Pratyaksha and Anuman. That's the key point, right? That Shabda never suffocates the other two, never kills them, never destroys them, never uh, um, uh, puts them into a corner. The, the other two remain very important for their respective areas and their respective strengths. They're crucial for that purpose. You know, I read some Christian theologians, they sometimes say that there are, there are different schools of theology in Christianity also. I just want to know whether there's something similar in our tradition also. There are some thinkers who, claim, who say that there is, a, there is the light of scripture and there's a light of nature. Hmm. And both point towards God. That, that's one, one school of thought. But the another is that they say that nature is deceptive. And if nature could tell us what scripture is telling, then there would be no need for scripture. There would be no need for faith. But this, of course, specifically, they use it with respect to the problem of evil. But they say that sometimes we have to discount the evidence. Faith means basically discounting the evidence of our senses. Because if the senses could tell us, uh, if the senses could give us evidence of of God's love, God's grace, then there would be no need for faith. Mm. So in that sense, is there some kind of dialectic uh, similar or what do you, what, what would you say about the dialectic from our, our, our tradition? Yeah, perspective? That's, that's not Jiva Goswami's perspective on the matter for sure. So, so let, let me, that, 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 that faith, that faith means discounting the senses. Uh, th that's, that's, that's a very, very limited notion of faith, extremely limited. Uh, uh, th for us, perfection is tattva darshi, right? That we should be able to see the truth through shabda, through pratyaksha, through anuman. Uh, all of these. This is what tattva darshi means. Darshana is the word for for uh, for philosophy. It's also the uh, word for vision, for sight, for seeing. It's the same word used for both anuman and for pratyaksha. And the tattva darshi is the source of uh, Shabda also. Sorry, which is the same word used for Pratyaksha Anuman? Uh, darshan. Like Darshan Shastra, Darshan means philosophy in Sanskrit. Like yeah, okay. Mimamsa so, Darshan, Vedanta Darshan, right? So Darshan is, philosophy means Anuman. So Darshan refers, it points to Anuman because that's what Darshan is. It's a philosophy. A philosophy is founded on Anuman. But darshan literally means seeing something. That's the heart of pratyaksha. And the one who has darshan, tattva darshi, that person is the source of pratyaksha. Uh, Jiva Goswami uh, describes this. is vaidusha pratyaksha. The vision of those who are vaidusha or wise, those who are self-realized, that he says is the source of shabda. Both in the sense that they convey shabda to us, uh, from the Lord, and also in the sense that their vision is as good as revelation from the Lord, both. So, so uh, for us, it's 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 much more for Jiva Goswami. This is much more. Uh, these three come together. It's not a uh, to say that that faith is the realm of one against the other is a very limited notion uh, of of what faith means for for Gaudiya Vaishnav. 
so we could say that uh, in one sense say you could say that anuma pratyaksh let's focus on pratyaksh right now so pratyaksh and shabda point in the same direction but shabda takes us further but it's not necessary that that, that we have to reject pratyaksh it's more sense we have to go beyond shabda pratyaksh not in the sense of rejecting it but in the sense of recognizing that there is more to reality than what pratyaksh can show hmm. but it is not that what pratyaksh shows is wrong hmm. so 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 this is now now we've come to the point which is to the heart of the question what is the relative scope of shabda and pratyaksha okay mm-hmm. so so let's let's look at that how far can sh- pratyaksha take you and in what direction and how far can shabda take you and in what direction by direction i mean on what subject or what topic mm-hmm. so so to to start that let me first read you a quotation from jiva goswami which Uh, on first read is extremely um overwhelming it looks like there's no scope for pratyaksha and anuman at all it's only shabda so here's 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 the quotation um so jiva goswami says this one means of knowledge namely shabda consists of statements that are free from the four defects okay um this is one reason he says shabda is superior it's free from the four defects other reasons for its superiority of shabda is that it does not depend on any of the others pratyaksha and anuman and although the others may assist shabda as far as they are able this one independent means of knowing shabda in performance of its function is seen to even overrule the others so the others can assist it but it has the ability to overrule pratyaksha and anuman and also he says that what is once established by shabda the fact established by the by shabda is irreversible by the others and finally shabda is most effective in proving facts that the uh, the powers of the other others pratyaksha anuman cannot even touch therefore he says the two other principal means of knowing so shab uh, pratyaksha anuman are reduced to shadow like subordinates of pratyaksha uh, uh, of shabda they are shadow like subordinates of shabda in other words it it's it seems this is this is the the purva paksha right it seems that from just from reading this out of context that shabda has the power to correct and to overrule pratyaksha anuman it has the power to give you knowledge that it, the others cannot give and pratyaksha anuman has no ability to correct or to add anything to shabda mm-hmm. so therefore the other two are shadows what use is there of the others right so if we stopped here then there's no scope for anything for science there's no scope there's no scope for logic philosophy argument but of course jiva goswami doesn't stop here he in fact describes a very rich and nuanced relationship between shabda and the others uh that is much much better than than just this in other words this he 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 presents initially to establish the supremacy of shabda and we should begin there by recognizing what are the the characteristics why it's supreme and you've listed them nicely on the board it can overrule the other pramanas it cannot be corrected by the pramanas it's the sole source of transcendental knowledge and it is free from the four defects you may want to add that one also so so these are the the reasons why jiva goswami says shabda is supreme but he doesn't stop here and that's the key point mm-hmm. yeah it's just, it's so important to read a text in full because this would seem to rule out any other any role for protection and anuman at all but but it's also nice to begin at this point because i think as gaudiya vaishnavas as vedantists we have to begin by acknowledging the supremacy of shabda right i as in even in this podcast as we're trying to uh explore 
the relationships between the three as dialogical in nature, I think we have to begin by stating clearly that Shabda gives us something that the others cannot. It gives us access to that which is transcendental, that which is beyond the scope of both reason and the senses. And this is why all the Vedanta Acharyas regard Shabda as the as the, the best pramana for their subject matter, which is uh, knowledge of uh, Brahman, a knowledge of the absolute truth. Mm. So it's a good place to begin, but it's a it's not the place to stop. And I think that's the point that we want to convey here is this is not where we want to end because Jiva Goswami does not end there. Our Acharyas don't end there. Prabhupada doesn't end there. This is like your earlier point that because we naturally trust Pratyaksha and we learn to trust Hanuman. So this is more like establishing the need and the authority of Shabda. But then it's like you have to bring the pendulum back to the balance point. Yeah. Yes. So the, the first question that Jiva, we want to raise here is it to, to now nuance the relationship. Okay. First question is, um, what counts as Shabda? Right. What what constitutes Shabda, that category? Uh, and on one level, the answer is easy. Uh, Jiva Goswami says the Vedas, right? The Vedas constitute Shabda. And indeed, they are in a category that is so powerful, it's called Apaurusheya, uh, that which is not composed by any human hand. Uh, it's composed by the Lord himself. It can be revealed through human beings, but uh, it, the origination is in the Lord. But yeah. he yes. does... Hmm. I'll raise a question and you can decide whether we have the time to go into this because you earlier mentioned also Vaidushya Pratyaksha. So, what is the understanding in our tradition of... Uh, we understand that there is the scriptures, like the Vedas have come from a divine source. But the scriptures are also associated with particular sages. Each Veda is associated with a particular sage and then the Bhagavatam is of course associated with Asdev. But then, is it that the, we consider the, the message itself, every single word is like dictated by the Lord, and that's what they're, they're simply becoming like a, a transcriber. Uh, I know there is a difference between, with respect to this in Shruti and Shruti also. But uh, when we say that they have a divine source, we also, the tradition also acknowledges that there is a human, we don't want to use the word source, but maybe human channel. So how exactly, what is it? Do you want to go into this right now or should we talk about it separately? Um, I can say something briefly about it, which is that um, the the Acharyas uh, and the, the Vedic tradition is very aware of the fact that divine revelation has human conveyance, right? That the way we get it is through parampara and that means that human beings convey, and over time, yogo nashta parantapa. If the human conveyors are not uh, reliable, they're not apta, they're not trustworthy, then then that knowledge can be lost, right? So, um, and and in terms of these conveyors, there's two two types that you can discern in sarva samvadini. One is uh, those um, rishis who are simply conveying Vedic mantras with no, uh, with very little agency themselves. They're not adding their realizations. Uh, they're not um, giving it based on their own understanding. They're simply conveying. And Jiva Goswami says, in every uh, kalpa, rishis of the same name appear to convey the same mantras. Uh, it may not be the same jivas, but they have the same names, so that the Vedic mantras can always be by the same rishis in exactly the same words. So I think the Vedic, and I be, by Vedic I mean the Vedic Samhitas, Rid, Yajur, Saman, Atharva. That tradition is very particular about the exact wording, and the rishis are merely, um, in a very limited sense, they're postmen, right? They're They're giving, but not digesting. It's just conveying exactly the way it is. Uh, the other type of conveyor... Is it probably the category of Shruti? 
Um, the, oh, okay, let's, let's not go into that's that. That's a little bit uh, uh, iffy, and I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, it's, a, it's a little blurry, I mean to say. Uh, but but the other type of conveyor you find of Shabda is those uh, rishis who are, or, 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 or devotees, who are conveying that same truth, but with their realization and application. So here, for example, Bhagavatam, uh, it says, Sutta Goswami says, Yatha dhitam yatha mati. Mm. That I'm giving this as I have learned it. And as I have realized it, as I have understood it. So, so that's that's a, um, a, a, a and and here with with like the Puranas and so on, the Acharyas are very clear that there are variant readings sometimes. Right? They'll they'll say they, they'll uh, put in yadva, for example, or atava, or pathantarena. They say pathantare. Mm -hmm. There's a, another patha. That they explain also. So they recognize that the shloka might be slightly different in a different manuscript. But it's okay. By explaining it, they're showing that the intended message is exactly the same. The meaning is the same. You know, when I first read Chakravarti Path's commentaries, I was struck by, in one sense, his nonchalance toward these variant readings. Yes. It's like, okay, it, it could be this, it could be this. It's almost like you have one target and that target is to be hit, whether you are having this reading or that reading, exactly. it just comes to that same target. So the understanding is the same. Hmm. And and so many times it says, right, that uh, that by being tasted by the mouth uh, or coming from the mouth of Shukadeva Goswami, from a fruit tasted by the parrot becomes sweeter means this is not a conveyance in a in in the in the very uh restricted sense that first sense this is conveyance in a much richer sense it's of good. of the the conveyor has something to offer it's the same siddhanta but it has become sweetened it has become applied by the um conveyor mm. So in this context, then the exact wording is less important. Okay. So here also, and it would mean that, uh, so while our Acharyas do analyze the specific words of the Bhagavatam, and they go deep into how particular words convey particular things, and so, so it's not that the words, specific words are unimportant, but it's just that they are not the all important thing. Yes. And, and okay, then I think this, we, it's a different subject, but this could also apply to say Prabhupada's works because Prabhupada uses certain words and words have particular meanings at particular times. So we, we had to look at the, the spirit or the intent behind those, what is the actual message? Uh -huh. And then we may have to, we may have to use the words which, are, which may be more understandable or less of triggering uh, words in today's context. Hmm. Yeah, the, exactly. So, so, so the the Vedas, the four Vedic Samhitas are fundamentally untranslatable. Uh, means you can translate them to understand their meaning if you like, but you cannot use that translation to perform Vedic yagyas. Uh, you have to recite it in exactly the same words and tone, the same pitch as as it has all, always been recited. But for the uh, Bhagavatam, for the Puranas, for the Vaishnava literature, as you're saying, the words are not unimportant. They're crucial. We The Acharyas love uh, uh, unpacking them and explaining them. At the same time, the power can be conveyed even in the English language or the mm -hmm. Bengali. And therefore, Prabhupada said, anyone who reads one page of Krishna book can can become, go back to God. It can become transformed, right? Is why? It's not in Sanskrit. Uh, it's not the original words. It's new words. For the first time in history, Prabhupada is writing those words. And yet they have the power. Why? Because they are coming 
from Vaidusha, right? The person who is actually a, a Tattvadarshi, the person who has the ability to convey Shabda, not in the minimalistic sense, not in the restrictive sense, but in a richer sense. So this is the difference between Vedic tradition and Vaishnav tradition in this regard. Uh, same you see like with the Quran, for example. The Quran is untranslatable. Uh, for most yeah, Muslims, Quran translated. is written on a tablet in heaven. Every word of it, every letter of it is written. And you can translate it for your own edification, but you cannot recite the Quran in any other language. Uh, so so it, it won't have the same power, the same effect. But we regard that the power of Shastra is not diminished by change in language. Mm. Especially, with, I think, among the various sacred books, Rama, the Ramayana has had the greatest impact on the Indian psyche. And it's quite often the vernacular Ramayans that have had a huge impact, whether it's Tulsi Ramayana or the Kamba Ramayana. And people memorize uh, so many verses from those and recite those and relish those also. So we can, uh, if you look at from the Falena Parichayate, there are people who have a rich, have achieved a rich level of bhakti, even if they have never really re read the Valmiki Ramayana. That's not their primary source of connection with Ram. Mm -hmm. So we could say in one sense, bhakti, it is said it's a, a pratihata. So it cannot be limited even by language in that mm -hmm. sense. Very nice. I like that. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yes. So thank you. So <clears throat> What you talked about the conveyors, so so you know there are two things. There is one thing is from the divine source. But it comes to the human level through a there's a human human. You use the word conveyor. I just want to differentiate between two categories over here. There is the human. Uh, maybe you could use the word receiver. The first receiver. No, the wherever it came from God, the first receiver. And then we could say we have a chain of human transmitters or human conveyors, as you said. Uh, so is there any um is there any difference in principle between the first receiver and the subsequent uh, transmitters? Hmm. What what kind of difference you mean? I mean, the point is, well, on one level, the answer is no, because this the is the whole... Mahata, uh -huh. That particular verse, it seems to be talking more about this. It is, by the power of time, things are getting deteriorated. Uh -huh. That means, originally, they were good. That uh -huh. means, there is what it seems to convey, there is no defect here. Uh -huh. But, defects can come subsequently. But, uh, it's not that... At one level, even the original sages, except Vyasdev, we consider him the literary avatar of the Lord. But apart from that, not every single sage is, is God himself descended to the world. So, so is there a possibility of the so Yoga Nashtaha happening at the original receiver also? Or we consider the original sages to be perfected beings? I, I, I mean to say, here we speak... The, the, in, in principle, yes. Original, even the defect can happen at any stage. So Dhritarashtra also heard uh, Bhagavad Gita, right? But it doesn't mean that he was the perfect receiver of Bhagavad Gita, at least at that stage. So, so what I mean to say is that defect can be there at any stage. But in reality, uh, we understand that the rishis are perfect. Mm. 